So people often ask me, do you believe in God? Which I don't, I don't like that question. I don't like that question. I don't like that question. Yeah, I don't like the question. People have asked me whether or not I believe in God and I've answered in various ways. No, but I'm afraid he probably exists. That's... The traditions bind the community together. Now I'm saying that, and I don't go to church, you know, and the reason I don't go to church is because, well, it drives me crazy to speak frankly. I haven't been able to sit in a situation like that ever since I was, well, ever, really. <laughs> that's really the truth of it, ever. Um, I'm not convinced that that's a good thing because I do believe, and I've had good conversations about this with Jonathan Pajo. I do believe that communal return to the source of the community's ethics is actually a necessary thing. And maybe I'm atoning for my past sins by doing these biblical lectures at the moment, which is something that's communal. And then, because there's also something about going where a bunch of other people are to reaffirm your commitment to to the good that you're all all aiming at that's that's got some power in it and i don't think that that's something that we should forego i think it's dangerous i mean look even if you're cynical about church and i guess i would put myself in that category it's certainly the case that communal church going in the 1950s say provided the average person with at least an hour a week where they were contemplating no matter how poorly the purpose of ethics in life and and the idea of a higher purpose and a higher meaning in life and you got to think that spending an hour a week thinking about that is better than never doing it at all i don't know how to that tradition can be revivified in a meaningful way but i think it's i really do think it's a catastrophe that we've lost it because we don't have a center an ethical center that holds our community together and the consequence of that is that we're fragmenting quite badly but what you see there is if that if you view someone with love, then it's incumbent upon you to treat them as if they're valuable. And then the more you treat other people as if they're valuable, the better person you are. That just comes along for the ride in some sense. So none of that seems questionable to me. That, that seems solid. And so then maybe the, mo the more love you view other people with, the higher the moral demand that's placed on you. And then I would say too, well then, that's another reason why it's so important to be truthful and, and in some sense to be good because it isn't obvious to me that you can withstand that moral load if you're compromised by too much sin. It's too much. And, and that's another thing that, that we're not very good at teaching young people about, you know, we shouldn't do that. You know, it's like there's a sanctimonious authority that goes along with that that's the wrong tone. It's more like... You know, I don't know how you lay it out properly, but you tell people that you love how to avoid the road to hell. And you don't do that because you're shaking your finger at them or because you're a moral authority. You do it because you don't want them to burn. And I think there's too much of the moral authority still in the church and not enough of the, you know, the love that helps people avoid the fire. Tammy, my wife, has always taken the idea of truth very seriously. Her recent brush with death has deepened her religious sense and impelled her towards a life that's more consciously focused on service to others, her family in particular, but not only her family, people beyond the family. And I also think that's a function to some degree of our stage of life. She's a grandmother now. and. Her children are grown and able to take care of themselves, and so she can turn her attention to other people, maybe farther afield from the immediate family. I'm watching what she's doing and listening to her and watching her practical application of her faith, and that affects me just as everything she does affects me, because I watch what she does and take it seriously.
Her recent actions have indicated she's, ha she's helped a number of people quite substantially, the group that she's been communicating with, and all of that's very interesting to me. She's showing me, I mean, I've taken the idea of God seriously for a very long time, and I've said on multiple occasions that I try to act as though God exists, and that that's essentially my definition of belief. When people say, do you believe in God? Belief is a multi-dimensional word, and one question is, well, what do you mean by belief? And for me, the proof of belief is to be found in action. And I decided that I would act as if God existed a long while back. And of course, I'm imperfect in that, inevitably. Now, she's doing that more explicitly as well. Not that she wasn't doing it quite well to begin with, but she's doing it more explicitly and also more within the confines of traditional religious conceptions. Uh, although she's not attending church, she's associating with a number of people who are formally religious, and all of that's informing the way that she conducts herself. It's watching her do that has also highlighted for me the missing praxis in Western Christianity. If, if you want to be a Christian, let's say, if you think that's necessary, it's not exactly obvious what you should do. You should go to church, but that's not enough, I don't think. I find it useful to contemplate the highest good on a continual basis. I'm trying to keep myself oriented in that direction. That's a, it's a religious orientation, fundamentally. It's an overwhelming orientation. But there's no escaping the questions of the ultimate meaning of life. I'm not an atheist anymore, because I don't look at the world that way anymore. I'm not a materialist anymore. I don't think the world's made out of matter. I think it's made out of what matters. It's made out of meaning. What we orient towards unconsciously, which means what captures our attention, is meaning, and it captures our attention before we know what it is. The brain acts as if the world's made out of information or made out of meaning. Who would have the audacity to claim that they believed in God if they examined the way they lived? Who would dare say that? To, to believe, you think, to believe in a Christian sense, to actually, this is why Nietzsche said there was only ever one Christian, and that was Christ. To have the audacity to claim that means that you live it out fully. And that's an, that's an unbearable task in some sense. To be able to accept the structure of existence, the suffering that goes along with it, and the disappointment and the betrayal, and, and to nonetheless act properly, right? To aim at the good with all your heart, right? To, to dispense with the malevolence and your desire for destruction and revenge and all of that, and to face things courageously and to tell the truth, to speak the truth and to act it out. That's what it means to believe. That's what it means. It doesn't, it doesn't mean to state it. It means to act it out. And unless you act it out, you should be very careful about claiming it. And so I've never been comfortable saying anything other than I try to act as if God exists, because God only knows what you'd be if you truly believed. I mean, if you think about it in some sense, that's the central idea in Christianity, is that if you were capable of believing, it would be a transfiguring event. A truly transfiguring event. And I know people experience that to one degree or another. But we have no idea what the limit of that is. And we have no idea what the possibility is within each person if they lived a life that was maximally courageous and maximally truthful. You know, because maybe you're running at 60% or 70% or 20% and at cross purposes to yourself. God only knows what you'd be if, if you believed. And so... Well, I act, I try to act like I believe, but I'd never claim that I manage it. So, okay, so you can think about Christ from a psychological perspective and the, the, criti the critic, my critic, this particular critic that I've been reading, said, well, that, that doesn't differentiate Christ much from a whole sequence of dying and resurrecting mythological gods. And of course, people have made that claim 
in comparative religion, Joseph Campbell did that, and Jung to a lesser degree, I would say, but Campbell did that. But the difference, and C.S. Lewis pointed this out as well, the difference between those mythological gods and Christ was that there's a, there's a representation of, there's a historical representation of his, of, of his existence as well. Now you can debate whether or not that's genuine, you can debate about whether or not he actually lived and whether there's credible objective evidence for that, but it doesn't matter in some sense because this, well, it does, but there's a sense in which it doesn't matter because there's still a historical story. And so what you have in the figure of Christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth. And in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't know. Okay. So it's a combination of those two things. And there's a... I mean, I speak about religious matters, but I don't see myself as a religious leader. I, I don't want to make that. God lift from me the intolerable burden of my ignorance, arrogance, willful blindness, bitterness, and resentment. As I pray that others rise above the same faults and temptations. I watched Fox News release a message this week. There are terrible things afoot under the surface of our society, and the perpetrators are coming for you and coming for us. And then I watched the Democrats respond in panic and anger, saying, There are terrible things afoot under the surface of our society, and the perpetrators are coming for you, coming for us. Are there terrible things afoot, bubbling under the surface? Is something coming for you and for us? Ask yourself how true that is of yourself and your own life. Have you addressed all that? Are you concerning yourself with the dust in your enemy's eyes instead of attending to the filth that obscures your own sight? Do we want accusation, suspicion, discord, derision, and hatred? Or the peace and prosperity and happiness that beckons to us at this moment like never before? Who's the enemy here? Is it the basket of deplorables? Is it the freaks and the queers? Is it the plumbers and carpenters and tradesmen and managers who work honestly and diligently during the day and the soldiers who stalwartly defend the borders and protect us? The divide. The enemy is the great and eternal adversary of mankind. And if we demonize our brothers, our comrades in arms, do we not precisely call that dread spirit forth? Have we not yet learned? Courage. Trust. Truth. Love. Even unto your enemy, which is yourself. God, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. May what is highest guide our vision. May what is highest open our ears. May what is highest guide our tongues. And may we pray, fearful of the hell we could so easily and carelessly create. Deliver us from evil. Shine a light into the corners of our dark hearts. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.